Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with Zach Bitter. All right, folks, welcome back to another episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast. I'm your host, Zach Bitter. And today I am coming to you with a solo episode where I have gathered some questions that got sent in to me from listeners or people following me on social media that I thought would be fun topics to touch on and give my two cents about. So for this episode, there's a few questions or a couple of questions, I should say, that kind of bleed into one another nicely. So I'll try to kind of cycle through those as if they were maybe one big question versus multiple and uh, yeah, and go from there. So the, the big one or ones that kind of uh, stick out are uh, around the topic of kind of how I actually structure my nutrition that I would describe as periodized carbohydrate intake within a low carbohydrate diet structure. And I oftentimes get a lot of questions about this one because it looks like if you take a snapshot of any one day out of my year, it may look quite a bit different than another day. So sometimes I think people get confused uh, by that. And, and a lot of that is just due to the nature of my lifestyle where you know, I might be peaking for a hundred mile race and doing like back-to-back long runs, or I might be in off season doing little running, uh, or I might be working on speed development or things like that, that are a little more foreign to the race day intensity. And then all these different variables kind of influence the way I structure the carbohydrate side of my fueling. And we'll go through some of that. And I'll give you kind of some, some general, uh, like kind of targets that I'm aiming for during these various phases of the year and hopefully clear that up a little bit. Another question came in that just was kind of curious about what my low carb race day nutrition looks like. So while following a low, I guess, essentially the question is if you're following a low carbohydrate diet, what does race day nutrition look like? Since the majority of endurance athletes are typically going to be moderate to high carbohydrate uh, how does that change if your foundational nutrition approach is, is going to be, is different than theirs. So we'll touch on that. And then finally, another one was I had a, a listener reach out and mentioned that they kind of transitioned from a low carb, high fat vegan to eventually including some fish and cheese in their diet, and then ultimately adding some meat back. And it's just curious about kind of how someone or how you maybe identify within a structured way of eating, uh, or, or how do you preserve maybe your individual identity within like a framework of a nutritional approach? All right. This episode of the human performance outliers podcast is sponsored by my friends at gooder sunglasses. Gooder sunglasses makes lightweight, comfortable sunglasses that don't move when you run. And they're all for only $25 each. They are no slip, no bounced, all polarized and all fun. And at $25 each, you can mix and match a bunch of different colors in order to coordinate with whatever outfit you have on, whether you're out there training or just enjoying the great outdoors. So folks, uh, Gooder is going to give you an extra 15% off your order when you use promo code HPO. So head over to gooder.com forward slash hpo that's g-o-o-d-r.com forward slash hpo and get yourself a pair of 25 dollars active sunglasses that are good for everyone 100 percent uv protection 100 percent polarized free u.s standard shipping on all orders over 50 dollars and a 30-day free returns with one-year warranty 100 percent carbon neutral and one percent for the planet head over to gooder dot com forward slash HPO promo code HPO for 15% off links for this can be found in the show notes or at zackbitter.com forward slash HPO sponsors. Also sponsoring this episode are my friends over at element 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 makes one of my go-to electrolyte supplements. They boast 1000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium and 60 milligrams of magnesium. Each one of these comes in an easy to use single servage package. So you can throw them in a suitcase, a backpack, a gym bag, stick them in your pocket, bring them wherever you're going when you're going to need a little bit of of electrolytes to go with your water. Uh, They have all sorts of different flavors from fruity flavors to more savory flavors. Uh, One of my personal favorites is their chocolate flavor, which I'll usually use about a half a pack in my coffee in the morning before heading out for a run. 
Generally, I like to mix one packet with around two liters of water in order to get what I think is a pretty good balance of water electrolyte uh, for my purposes, but uh, feel free to try out different ranges to suit your needs as you check out the flavors. They are offering a free eight pack for $5 shipping to check them out if you want to see what they're all about. You can head over to drinkelement.com forward slash HPO. That's drinklmnt.com forward slash HPO. You can also see any of the show sponsors, details, and links at their landing page on my website, which is zachbitter.com forward slash HPO sponsors. Let's get into these questions. The first one came from Daniel South. He says, hi, Zach. Any chance you could talk about carb periodization in training and racing and how you implement it in a future episode of your podcast? I've been reading Peak, and I'm curious how you approach this nutrition strategy. Thanks. All right. Awesome, Daniel. Thanks for the question. And this is a good one. I'll give a quick plug for my friend, Dr. Mark Bubbs. He's been on the, the podcast a, a couple of times now. Peak is a great book. Uh, I, I really like what he did with that. I've said this before, but I think it's got a good balance of like, what do we think we know based on the current research? And then where do we think it's maybe heading or where there's some applications as we learn more? And just like he gives a little bit of a foresight of kind of how he sees some of these things maybe playing out as we gather more information and, and continue to test these different uh, approaches uh, to training and nutrition across a variety of different sports and ultimately uh, kind of just given his, his take on all of that. So I recommend reading that book if you haven't. But to get to your question, Daniel, I'm going to break this down into kind of four phases. So the way my year typically plays out is I'll have like an off season. So that's one phase. And then I'll have like a foundational development phase where I'm working on just kind of confirming that my foundation or my aerobic base is where I want it to be to take on a structured training plan. Then I'll have a phase. Or it's, just, it's technically kind of two phases where I'm working primarily on speed work development. There'll be a little bit of building the long run out within that, but much more within the framework of a traditional long run versus what you a lot of times see in these longer ultra marathons where you might do back to back really long runs. So that's that third phase. And then finally, the race day intensity phase of my training where I'm starting to focus a lot of my time and energy on the specifics that I'll be doing on race day. So that ends up being slower running oftentimes when compared to the speed work training, at least on the, the key days or the priority days and a lot more volume too. So it, it, it kind of lowers intensity, increases volume a lot of times. So those are kind of the four times of year. And each one of those, I do things slightly differently within them in order to I try to maximize my nutritional strategy. So off season is the easiest one for me because it's low intensity. Often I might be doing some strength work and some really light running if I feel good or taking on some sort of, you know, activity that I have been sidelining due to the amount of time and energy spent towards running when I'm kind of in season. So I might just be like some pretty casual biking or hiking, things like that. So it's really not a time of year where I'm pushing my heart rate up into high levels for, for very long at all. So I'm just not tapping into my muscle glycogen the way I would be when I'm kind of rinsing and repeating a lot of endurance workouts. And because of that, that's usually the time of year where I'm quite a bit more strict with carbohydrates. So I'm, a, my dietary habits might look a lot more like a strict ketogenic diet during those parts of the year. And really just depends on the year will depend on how much of that time I spend in there. I'll usually do at minimum a couple times a year where I'll do two weeks where I can remove the structure altogether and kind of take an off season. If I need more time than that, I'll take it. But historically two weeks is usually when I get to the point where I feel like my mind and my body have sort of recovered from whatever it was I was doing before. And it's time to kind of gradually start to kind of tease in some of that foundational development and things like that. Uh, so that, that time of year, the, the way I try to explain to people is it usually ends up being about 5% or less of my intake coming from carbohydrates. So, you know, my energy output is quite a bit lower during those weeks. I'm not having hardly any, if any, like four or 5,000 calorie days, like I might during some of the bigger training weeks during the season. 
So like my intake as a whole comes down quite a bit, but I'm usually about 5% carbohydrate there, you know, maybe 20% protein at the most. And then the remainder being fat. So usually the fat is going to be somewhere around 75% during, during that time of the, the training structure. When I get into the foundational development, a lot of times this is still relatively low intensity compared to some of the other stuff. The way I kind of look at it is my aerobic threshold and below is a lot of where my focus point is going to be during this. I'm just confirming with myself where my fitness is currently at and where maybe I'm going to need to spend a little more time as I get myself built up for whatever race I'm doing next. So I'll be doing uh, a lot of training where I'm pushing up to my aerobic threshold. And then uh, if I need extra days to kind of bounce back from those sessions, I will take them. But I'm, I'm trying to gauge essentially like how much of how much volume can I can I maintain up to my aerobic threshold and build from there. So using like historic benchmarks within that framework is usually what I'll end up doing. I have an idea like, oh, I can if I can only do, say, like 50 miles during the week where I'm pushing up to my aerobic threshold and still feel like I'm bouncing back and recovering. I'm just going to keep doing that until I can get that up a little bit higher. There's other times where for whatever reason, I just maintained a lot of the fitness from the previous training block for whatever reason. And I start that foundational development side of things and it just is clicking right away. My paces are already quite low at, uh, you know, that aerobic threshold. And then and then I'm a little bit more uh, speedy in terms of entering the next phase of training. If, uh, if the timeline kind of presents itself, the other thing I usually consider with this too, is like this phase of the year can really be stretched out about as long as you need it to. So there are times where I'm ready to start, say the speed work development phase of my training, but I hold off on it because the timeline to the race I'm doing is it's just too early to start. So that's another thing I'll consider there, but within that foundational development phase of training, I'm oftentimes taking in roughly about 10% of my intake from carbohydrate. Uh, so I'm going up a bit from that off season and just basically supplementing the increase in training with a little bit more carbohydrate, because I am going to be burning some carbs when I'm pushing up to that aerobic threshold. Uh, you, it's going to be a much higher ratio of fats to carbs than what you're probably going to see in most moderate to high carbohydrate endurance athletes, or certainly comparative to myself, which is really where you should be looking at it. You shouldn't necessarily be too invested in, well, what's someone else's ratios at a given intensity, e even if they follow a similar diet as you, uh, you might want to actually go and figure that out and see where they are for you personally. So I have had like fat, fat oxidation tests done where you get on a treadmill and they'll test like kind of what the ratios of fats to carbohydrates are at various intensities. So I do have like some ideas of where mine is typically at if my diet's kind of consistent to when it was for, uh, for those particular types of tests. And for me, that means like, if I get enough volume, I find like, I just feel a little bit better when I'm bringing a little bit more carbs back than I did during that off season phase. So it starts to creep up kind of at that point to that 10% rough range there. Uh, then I enter that speed work phase of training, and this is where I find it varies the most from day to day. And part of that reason is because when you're doing speed work and I would define speed work as anything from moderate to high intensity. So you're going to get like, you're going to get intensities that you can do for quite a while, but they're going to pass that easy pace category. Or uh, another way to maybe think about it is above your aerobic threshold, you're getting up to like 80 plus percent of your max heart rate during, during a lot of those workouts. And when you're doing those, they, they tend to be kind of polarizing with what you do with the rest of your running. So there's a lot more kind of hard or moderate one day, easy, the next kind of back and forth during my training, during these phases of the year. So when I'm doing that, I'm just a little more aware of positioning the carbohydrates during or around the types of activities that they're going to benefit me the most. So let's say I'm doing like two speed works during a week on say a Tuesday and Thursday, I may position the majority of my carbohydrates for that day around those speed sessions. And I may actually, what I like to call borrow carbohydrates from other days during that phase of training. So if you think of it like this, if you looked at my speed work training phase of the year and averaged out every day, I'd probably average out roughly 150 grams of carbohydrates 
but it's not necessarily going to be 150 grams every day. So there may be a day where I'm doing say short intervals that day. I might borrow upwards to hundred grams of carbohydrates from the previous or following day in order to position more of them around those more, uh, those higher intensity efforts, but then I'm going to have an easy day following an easy day. I don't really need to be tapping into my, my glycogen stores the way I would. So I might have a much lower, like 50 to hundred grams of carbohydrates that following day. And then as you average those out, those easy days and those higher intensity days, uh, they end up coming out to around 150 grams of carbohydrate during that. But there may be days where I'm hitting upwards, even 300 in a day, if the, if the workout's big enough and it, it makes sense in order to execute that workout. And they're just the bigger, the workout usually though, the more rest needed to recover from it. So if I have a really big workout and need multiple days to bounce back from it, it's just more days to kind of keep it below that average in order to kind of even it out, if that kind of makes sense. And then that third phase of my training is that race day intensity. So this is the time of year where I'm starting to push a lot of my time and energy into developing up the long run of the back-to-back -back long run, because those workouts tend to be the most specific to what I'm usually training for. If I'm peaking for a hundred mile race, and that might be like working up to where I'm doing back-to-back -back days of say 30 plus miles or three to five hours each. Uh, depending on the terrain that I'm running on at the time, typically speaking volume in terms of time gets a little higher when I'm doing like a more trail race, because I find that my body is able to tolerate higher amounts of time volume, probably due to the impact differences when I'm running up and down trails versus kind of just the continuous pounding of a track or a road. Uh, whereas those, uh, I tend to have a little bit less time on feet for my long run development, but also the distances tend to match up fairly close, uh, partly because you're just moving faster on those more controlled environments and you hit those numbers, those higher mileage numbers a lot quicker in those scenarios versus, you know, slogging up a 15 to 20% incline or something like that. So during this time of year, I'm kind of reverting back more or less to that foundational development number. So that like 10% ish number of carbohydrate intake is where I'll, I'll normally land during this phase because the intensities tend to mirror that foundational development phase a lot closer. The difference here is oftentimes I'm doing more of it, partly because I'm more fit than I was back then and can handle a larger training load. Also, because I'm starting to try to get myself ready to the, the rigors of being out on my feet all day long, running at a pace that I can sustain for a hundred miles. And this puts me in a position where my actual caloric intake is going to be a fair bit higher due to the extra energy demand. And that also opens the door to have a little bit more carbohydrate, just because if I'm going by a percentage of say 10%, the increase of say five, six, 700 calories, uh, is going to be, is going to come along with some extra carbohydrate there. There are times where like, periodically through this phase, it's usually around four to six weeks that'll be in here where I'll start to kind of notice a little bit of maybe residual fatigue from, from not increasing my carbohydrate above 10%. And I'll have a day or two here and there where I'll just have a little bit more and, and ratchet it up. Uh, so it's not super uncommon that I'll have days here or there where I'm up to say 20 to maybe even 30% carbohydrate. Those are pretty rare days, but they do pop up from time to time. And over the years, since I've been doing this for over 10 years now, I start to kind of recognize like when I'm kind of in that part or can somewhat predict when they're going to maybe occur. And, you know, my suspicion with that is essentially just the amount of time and energy being spent out there. I'm going to be tapping into my muscle glycogen, uh, to some degree. And because of that, there is a chance that I'm not necessarily replacing it quickly enough due to the, the nature of the lifestyle there. So the way I like to think about that is it's like, when you're doing that much volume and training, you're essentially putting your metabolism on fast forward. So every minute of the day, you kind of produce or put out a little bit more energy than you normally would. And that just makes the framework of what you're going to need to do within say a 24 hour time period, a little bit different, uh, especially compared to the off season. Hey folks, just a quick reminder, this episode is sponsored by Gooder Sunglasses. You can get 15% off your entire order at gooder.com forward slash HBO. That's G-O-O-D-R.com forward slash HBO. Use promo code HBO and buy Element Electrolytes. You can get a free sample pack for the cost of shipping by going over to drink 
lmnt.com forward slash HPO. Also, if you're interested in the details and links of any show sponsors, you can find those at the landing page, which is zachbitter.com forward slash HPO sponsors. Then when we get to kind of race day itself, uh, this is where it gets a little interesting to maybe describe because you have what I like to call like your exogenous and endogenous fueling options. So on the day of a race, let's say I'm running hundred miles, I'm going to burn roughly like 12,000 calories during that day. So there's a lot of energy being, being burnt and I'm not going to consume anywhere near 12,000 calories for that day. I will likely make up the deficit of that race day in the subsequent days by just exceeding my energy output, which is a lot easier when you're not running. So, you know, if I do a hundred mile race, I'm, I'm probably not running for at least three days, if not a full week. And if I am running at all, it's going to be very short, very low intensity, and just not a lot of energy burn above and beyond resting metabolic rate, comparatively speaking. So there's just a good window of time to kind of catch up with that really at the end of the day, there's no way you can like physically fuel a hundred mile effort entirely during it itself. So you're going to take a calorie deficit. You, so you have to position your body to be able to do that, to be able to make it through that consistently with the amount of fuel you can take in. So for this, I'm looking at just like, well, what is my onboard fuel options? And that's muscle glycogen and body fat, essentially body fat is inexhaustible even for a super lean endurance athlete for a single day event. Glycogen is very much exhaustible. So I'm going to be pulling from both of those during the day. The one that's going to potentially deplete to the level where it impacts my performance is going to be the muscle glycogen. So I'm just going to commit that day to knowing a huge portion of my calorie intake or a huge portion of my energy output is going to come from body fat. And that's going to be energy output. I do not need to replace during the event itself, but I will replace it after, as I said before. So that leaves my muscle glycogen. That's the one I need to defend. So I like to kind of put everyone in the same camp with this, regardless of whether they're like me and following a low carbohydrate approach, or they're someone following a moderate or high carbohydrate post approach. Either way, your goal that day is to defend muscle glycogen to the degree that you don't feel like your body is fighting against you by defending it uh, and protecting what's left. So I believe where the research stands currently, muscle glycogen depletion, once it hits around 40% is when you're going to start to notice that your body is uh, going to kind of fight you a little bit, or you might notice that a specific pace you had been hitting earlier that day feels like you have to give a little more effort to maintain. So during, if you start noticing that, that could be a sign, especially if you've been out there for, for a few hours that you're starting to dip around that number. And I'm trying to, so I'm trying to stay away from that. So if I look at my fat oxidation tests, when I'm going at kind of my, my PR hundred mile pace, uh, that I'm going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of like 80 to 85% fat and 15 to 20% carbohydrate. So if I'm kind of consistently burning that throughout the course of roughly 12 hours, then I will be dipping into my muscle glycogen at a rate of 15 to 20% of my energy output per hour. If you look at my pace for hundred miles, we're looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of 800 to thousand calories per hour. So I can estimate there that I'm going to probably be burning somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 to 200 calories per hour from muscle glycogen, uh, or exogenous carbohydrates. So since I don't have enough muscle glycogen to defend that number for 12 hours on board, I'm going to need to bring it in during the race. So I stay away from that 40% number. If, uh, if I'm able to do that, that's when I feel like I'm strong at the end of the race. I feel like I can close hard and I don't feel like I'm slowing down and sometimes feel like I'm even having the best part of the race near the end. Uh, so I'm usually targeting somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 40 grams of carbohydrate per hour during the event itself in order to kind of make up that difference between fats and carbohydrates at that intensity throughout the course of the day. For me, I like to structure this in a way where it is kind of some solid foods and some liquid calories or it's like sports products. Reason being is digestion is one of the biggest concerns when it comes to eating 
during these workouts for this long, I find that I have a lot less of a problem doing that when I'm at 30 to 40 grams per hour versus trying to push up to 50 to 70 grams, which is what I would likely have to do if I was following a moderate high carbohydrate diet. You know, lots of folks in the sport have no problem managing that logistic and they're going to target that higher 50 to 70 grams per hour and defend their glycogen and then, you know, stick to their moderate high carbohydrate diet. For me, I feel better when I do it the other way. So I'm sticking to it until it changes or I see reason to change it in my results and my, in my performance. But what that means then is I'll do like, uh, some about 50% of my calorie intake from a product called S fuels race plus. And then the other 50% will be something that is uh, solid food. And I like to contrast the flavor profile. So since race or S fuels race plus is a powder, I put in liquid. So it's wet, slightly sweet. Uh, it's got a little bit of a creamy texture to it. So there's a little bit of fat and a little bit of protein in there to help ease digestion and some electrolytes in there as well. Uh, but it's a very different flavor than say something that's crunchy, solid, salty, maybe savory. So I try to pick something that's going to maybe match that second set of, uh, flavor textures in order to have a little bit of difference. They call it palate fatigue in ultra marathon running, but essentially if you're doing the same thing the entire way, there's a chance that like, there'll just be a point where you're just like, you get kind of nauseated, even thinking about it, get bored with it. And one thing you'll notice if you do a hundred mile race or anything really long like this is goofy little things incentivize you. You find yourself in these places where you're just looking for little things to keep you motivated and keep you, uh, going at the pace and focused. And even if it's changing what you're eating or doing something slightly different can be a big help. And since a lot of the events I do are on very controlled areas, like a 400 meter track, there's not a lot of environmental variance in the, the changing. So I can't like look forward to like a scenic look or a different trail or something like that. It's, it's like, if it's a 400 meter loop, it's like, I've seen the whole race in less than two minutes. And then I'm going to be dealing with that exact same environment all day long. So l- weird little things like changing what you're eating or what you're drinking can sometimes be motivating or give yourself a mini target to kind of focus on as you're, you know, moving through that day. So for those kind of, uh, the, the products that I'm using that are more solid food. A lot of times I'm doing things that are like something like a cracker or a pretzel or a chip that's salty, crunchy, savory, but still is going to have enough carbohydrate in it. So I'm hitting that 30 to 40 grams per hour and adequately defending that muscle glycogen. Uh, sometimes I'll do things like sourdough bread with maybe a little bit of peanut butter and a little bit of honey on there or something like that. Those of what have been historically worked well for me. I've had a lot of coaching clients that will do things like fruit. I find that to be kind of similar in flavor and texture. So it's not that I won't do fruit. If it's like a really hot race, I'm doing like a trail hundred miler that gets warm. That might just look appealing at an aid station or something like that, in which case I wouldn't necessarily avoid it. Uh, but you know, that's another option. Sometimes people will like to, to gravitate towards, uh, another one would be like, that's really easy to digest for me is like, if I make up like, uh, a bowl of rice and cook it in like bacon or something like that and salt it, you get uh, plenty of carbohydrate from that to hit that 30 to 40 grams per hour. Plus you get the salty, savory, a little bit of fat, a little bit of protein from the bacon too. That's going to kind of help with the digestion side of things, ease it, ease it a tad. And, and, and that's kind of, that's kind of how I'm structuring my race day fueling strategy. Um, yeah. So I think we covered the points for that one. Uh, Daniel, if I missed anything that you were intending to get out with that question, shoot me a note and happy to cover in a future episode. Uh, The next one was uh, from Ali Smith. And Ali says, having been a low carb, high fat vegan, I ate fish and cheese for the first time in two years today. Am I kidding myself by not adding meat to question mark? I think I'm having an identity crisis, having been the vegan for such a long time. How do you manage your identity within the prism of low carb, high fat? This is a good question because I think a lot of times when you start taking on a nutritional approach that is specific, you end up finding groups of people who are also doing it. And I think that that's generally good because there is a lot of information and mistakes you can eliminate by speaking to people who have kind of gone through this before. Uh, Some things are much more studied and there's a 
kind of a more distinct template that can be followed without having to have that. And then there's other things that are relatively new or relatively unstudied where it can be useful to be talking to a group of people where if you experience something that you don't understand why it's happening and everyone else says, oh yeah, we had that happen too. And this is what we did. And it clears up. You at least have some starting points or some options to play around with there. So I don't really think there's a problem with engaging with like communities that have a focus point or an identity around a specific nutritional approach. I do think you want to go in there though, with the mindset of like, I'm focusing on something that can be sort of universally, uh, universally like included for everyone, regardless of their diet. So for me, I like to use performance for that. A lot of other people will maybe think like health, um, And the reason I do that is because like performance is my goal. The diet that I choose to follow isn't the reason I'm doing it. So if I would find that by adding this other thing that goes against what a typical person following this nutrition program would do helps me with performance, it's clear in my mind that that's my, my primary target. And that's essentially how I came to the framework that I have, because you know, when I first got into this, it was, you know, there was a lot of incentive, I would say to be like, oh, you're a keto runner, you're a keto endurance athlete. And it's like, are my blood ketones typically in what would be considered like a ketogenic range? Yes. Even when my carbohydrates are their highest, I'm still typically producing blood ketone levels that are, you know, above 0.5 millimoles, if you want to use that as kind of the entrance point. Uh, But am I following a diet that's as strict as say 50 grams of carbohydrate or less. No, very rarely actually just during my off season for the most part. So it's like, if I want to try to like position myself as someone who's a keto endurance athlete and actually follow that parameter of say 50 grams or less, if that's the way you want to define it, then, you know, it could come at the expense of performance for me. If I'm ignoring that by trying to like fit into that specific thing. So Ali, I think you're, you're somewhat answering your own question in terms of terms of like, you've clearly been open to making changes when you see they're maybe potentially beneficial for either health or performance, whatever your goals were when you added the fish cheese, and now I guess meat to, uh, to your, to your nutrition strategy and, uh, you know, finding, finding that as maybe a little bit of an identity crisis, I can understand being maybe a little more powerful within the vegan community, because there is that kind of also the, the, the ethical side of is a reason why some people will choose that way of eating and things like that. So you may find that you alienate yourself from some of the folks that you were engaging with in the past there. Uh, but what I find is, um, a lot of times it just depends on where you look. I think you can find like plenty of, uh, people who are, who are vegan that you'll still be able to engage with in a friendly manner that, uh, that won't be too disappointed in your, in your dietary changes. If you want to kind of maintain some friendships within that community versus just saying, Oh, now I have to just make all new friends within some other like dietary, uh, community, something like that. So I like to think of it more as like, well, how, what, what am I actually trying to do here? And that's really my identity. So like, if you want to be an endurance athlete and you find that low carbohydrate works for you and the low carbohydrate vegan approach wasn't before, I would just say, Hey, I'm a runner. I'm trying to find the path forward that works well for me. So I feel good, perform good and can stick to it. And whatever that happens to be, will be my individual identity. And then I will like engage with other folks with that in mind versus trying to force yourself into a specific kind of predetermined set of parameters. If that makes sense. Um, Ali, uh, definitely shoot me a note if I missed anything or the intent of your question as well, but otherwise, uh, those are the kind of the topics I wanted to go through for this episode. Uh, these are, these are kind of fun ones. I, I get asked these questions or like elements of these questions a fair bit when I'm on other podcasts, but I don't find that I always discuss them in, in detail on here. A lot of times we're, when they do come up, it's because I have a guest who is, uh, either studied or tried, or even sometimes PhD nutrition, like related expert that, uh, you know, has some insight into like maybe why, what I'm doing is working for me. Uh, or if I'm missing something that would, would further improve and stuff like that. So I think sometimes you maybe have to put puzzle pieces together to kind of get an idea of some of it. If, uh, if you're listening to this podcast consistently, so, uh, thanks 
to those who sent over these questions. If you are interested in having a question or a topic addressed in one of these solo episodes, you can shoot me a note uh, at hpopodcast at gmail.com or reach out to me on social media. A lot of times what I'll do is I'll put up a post on Twitter where I'm just at Zach or at Z bitter and like uh, asking uh, the people who are following me there, what topics and questions they might have for a future episode. So if you see that you can drop it in on that as well. Uh, but otherwise uh, I'll, until next time, uh, thank you for checking out the human performance outliers podcast and have a great rest of the day. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with Zach Bitter. All right, folks, if you are interested in adding some structure to your training program, I have some options that might interest you. Over on my website, ZachBitter.com, I have a wide range of ready-made plans that have options for beginners to advanced endurance athletes. I also have personalized plan options where I will cater a plan specific to the event you are preparing for and your personal schedule and training availability. You can also access a variety of add-on options from email collaboration to consultation calls to help guide you through your training and nutrition needs. You can access these with or without a formal plan. So head over to ZachBitter.com and let me know what you think.